You gotta go pink, you know, if there's a choice. Oh, see, you've got, yeah, the fuzzy. Yeah. Kind of thing. It's like a Russian's hat is kind of how I think of it. Like one of the <laughs> big fluff balls. But my husband picked it out for me. So I, nice. I said, you do the research. <laughs> I'll just put That's it on. Great for sound. That's good. So, yeah, we're all podcasters showing off all the microphone equipment. So Mm-mm. great. Lily, welcome to the show and, and, and welcome everybody. Our guest, uh, Lily, how do, how do you say your name? <laughs> Lily Allen Duenas. Okay. For those of you podcasters out there, you want to ask that before you hit record. Just uh, as an example that I was giving everybody. Um, and Good educational moment right there. Nice. <laughs> exactly. It's like always a subtext of how to podcast, you know, out there. There's not enough of them. We got to get more. So uh, welcome to the show. And, and this is really, really exciting. I also am really grateful to welcome a co-host for today, uh, which is Kathleen Welcome, Kathleen mm. Brennan Thanks. from the On the Blue Couch podcast, friend and fellow mm. podcaster. Um, and uh, now, Lily, you podcast as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, the founder and host of the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast. Great. How long have you been doing that? A full year. My podcast anniversary was last week. This oh, is what's yes. up. <laughs> are, you, are you good at remembering anniversaries for like special episode type of things? Or I, Ooh, I, am, good not, question. I am not good at that. So. I would say I'm okay at it. I, well, my episodes are every Friday and I, I'm also on episode 50. So I thought 52 would be my year anniversary, but I did a 10 minute intro. Welcome to the podcast two weeks before doing my first episode. So it just was kind of like luck of the draw that my anniversary is not 52. It's at week 50. <laughs> 50 out of 52 after a year. That's pretty good. I'm just Yeah. You know. Very consistent. Yeah. I only missed uh, my release dates would have been on Christmas itself. And then on New Year's itself. So I just took those two weeks off um, of producing content just because it was the actual holidays. So makes sense. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, great. Well, welcome. Uh, We're going to be talking today about some of the ways that you integrate uh, yoga and physiology and diet and some of those things into healing. But let's let's let you start out. What can what do you want to tell us uh, about you and the way you work? And who are you anyway? Oh yeah, who am I? Good question. Um, that's a good that's question to ask yourself. Philosophical too. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we'll go there. A uh, human being, a human, not a human doing. Uh, yeah, we can go deep. We can go deep. <laughs> oh, wow, it's already deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thanks everyone for having me. So excited to be here and on the show. I'm Lily Allen Duenas, and as I mentioned, I'm the podcast host of the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast, and also the founder of the Wild Yoga Tribe. And we're a community of global yoga teachers energy workers, meditation, you know, people, guides or people who are just interested in it. It's just a kind of a really beautiful worldwide community of people coming together and wanting to go a little deeper into spirituality, mindfulness, um, different energy practices. And I love that it really is every corner of the globe. I mean, from Egypt to Estonia, from Greece to Ghana, like we're all in it together. And I really love that. I love that in the pandemic, when I launched my podcast, I was thinking, man, we all are so isolated. And I, I usually travel and I teach in other countries or I do more retreats or vipassanas or other th- experiences that are global in nature. But I wanted to do something that could still be with that community and honor that community and charge and kind of send energy into it, even though we couldn't actually physically get together. So it's been really exciting to to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did you discover yoga? Where did that begin for you? That's actually a fun question because I came to it when actually over half of my life ago, which feels silly. I'm 31 and I found it. I first came to the mat when I was 16. It just was at a local gym in California. My high school friend's mom went to this gym. She went to the gym sometimes and said, hey, there's this thing called yoga. I vividly remember making that joke about yogurt, yoga, like, wait, what is this thing? Is it yogurt? Like, is there yogurt going to be served after? I don't know why, but it was just that 16-year-old sense of humor, which is so great. And I wish we all had it still. Like, let's bring that back. <laughs> but, but, they, uh, but they do oh. serve yogurt after, right? I, this is right. Um, uh, yeah, many flavors. If oh, there's yeah. not more than five, it's not a real yoga class. So <laughs> I started practicing, as I mentioned, when I was 16, but it was just, you know, taking two classes in a year because it was just kind of coming to it. But it felt immediately like the first, you know, five minutes of the class, like coming home, like something I was remembering and something that felt so just essential kind of to my being and, and my, it just, 
I'd never encountered anything like it that could actually get my busy, busy mind to calm down and just kind of tap into that sense of stillness. Uh, I tried meditation before at a YMCA summer camp, which was super cool. I was like 12, 13 and doing a week of me- morning meditation classes, which also are, is such a powerful tradition. But for me, yoga really as a gateway to meditation. So when I went to university, I started practicing four times a week. I found some studios that do great student discounts. I, If anyone listening out there is a student, most yoga studios don't, I know it maybe seems expensive, but there's usually very affordable monthly, you know, half off or more than half off rates. And so when I graduated, I moved abroad to Greece for a little while to teach art. And then when I came back and was a marketing manager for four years and I just kind of got burnt out after nonprofit life and then serving on multiple board as directors and just being as, as involved in my community and friends and relationships as possible. But I just got this feeling of being a little burned out, but very unfulfilled, like something wasn't quite right. So I spent a whole year of just meditating on it, asking myself that question and just trying to wait for the answer to come, not rushing that answer. I I really wanted to rush it. (laughs) I want to change. I want something different. But I, I tried my hardest to be patient with myself and really listen And so when this, you know, voice inside of me said, you know, you're meant to help people find wellness from within and really heal and empower them to make, you know, healing choices in their lives. Uh, And by being a yoga teacher was my gateway, my door for that. And so after hearing that voice within two weeks, I had a plane ticket booked to Kathmandu, a yoga teacher training, my deposit down, and I'd had a month approved sabbatical from work to go just try, see if that was right for me. And within 24 hours, I knew, oh yeah, this is, this is me. <laughs> so then uh, after three months, sold everything, boxed everything up and moved to Cambodia, got a job teaching yoga on an island resort. And then uh, that's, that was the gateway again to a crazy few years of, of traveling and teaching and learning. Do you, what would you say are some of the benefits people start to experience? Uh, and, I, you know, I know as I'm thinking about this too, you know, when you go into a new exercise program, if people are thinking of it as an exercise program, you're talking about a lot deeper than that. But I know even if I start jogging, which I have done and do occasionally, there's a recovery time of like, well, it's this long until it's fun. It's this long until I feel like it's helping instead of hurting me or whatever. It's There's a transition time. Um, but what, what do you see people when they're new to it go, going through? Yeah, great question. And I'd say, I would like to point out too, that there's so many different types of yoga asana practice, the physical. So if somebody is very new to yoga and they immediately walk into a ashtanga, you know, very powerful, uh, or a power yoga class, they will have a totally different understanding of what, a yoga class is versus if they go to a yin yoga class where you hold a yoga pose and it's always on the ground, you're always seated, usually for about, you know, three minutes each pose, very calming. So when people say, oh, I don't like yoga, I went once, I like to say, oh, so you tried one blueberry and you decided you don't like fruit. Like you have to try an apple and a banana and a strawberry. Like you have to try the different types to really find what resonates. Just like you wouldn't just play basketball and say, oh, I I hate all sports. All right. You got to try more. Uh, yeah. No, but that's good. How, how do people just through sampling or is the, would you suggest somebody looks at the types or how would you select what's right for you? I think everybody has such a different approach. And I love that because some people feel really comfortable doing a few YouTube classes first. So if you are looking at a, a local yoga studio and you see they offer power yoga, yin yoga, hatha, vinyasa, flow, like whatever these words are. Yeah, they're literally in another language, literally. And so when people are like, I don't know what that is. It's like, of course you don't. You shouldn't know it. Don't feel stupid. Don't feel like hesitant or confused. It's, it is literally a different language. And so that's why I think kind of checking out a vinyasa class on YouTube, trying a 20-minute, a 30-minute, and checking out a hatha and seeing which one feels better to you. Uh, you can also, you know, just Google a little bit and say, oh, a hatha class is slower than a vinyasa. Okay, so you have a little bit frame of reference. Or there's yoga studios that offer, you know, many, many different classes. And usually first week is free or first week is $5. And then you just kind of try. 
a few different classes and see what works. But I'm really excited. I'm going to launch a, like a free webinar course thing on Teachable where if you're totally new to yoga, you have no idea what's going on, it's just for free. It'll be a, a few modules so you can be walked through what is the different types of yoga, what to expect when you come in a class. Do you bring your water bottle? Do you wear socks? You know, just questions I think that people have popped into my DMs with. And I love, love, love working with new yoga teacher or new yoga students. If I'm the, the teacher that gets to introduce you to yoga, you literally gave me a Christmas gift, basically. It's a huge deal for me. So if anyone has questions, reach out, Wild Yoga Tribe, anywhere and everywhere. I'm happy to be with you. Well, and I know that you're, you know, you have knowledge around the kind of science and the magic of what's actually happening internally as people move through yoga. And I'd love to hear just more about kind of your perspective on, yeah, what's happening when people are coming in stressed and as they evolve through the yoga practice, what's happening that's helping them to heal in all aspects of their yeah, self. Thanks, thanks yeah. Kathleen. Great question. Because yoga is amazing. And from the first class, from the first five minutes, maybe, you'll notice a difference in your sympathetic or in your nervous system because we're always kind of in this fight flight, you know, emails and stimulation and honking and podcasts. And like, there's always so much going on for us that we're usually pretty activated in the Western world on a day-to-day basis. So that's, that's our sympathetic when we're focused, awake, active, thinking, working. Think about how many hours in a day we probably are more on that, in that zone. Whereas parasympathetic is, you know, these amazing um, optimistic functionings of the body get to happen, like reproduction, like the actual systems are functioning for digestive, immune functions, and uh, memory consolidation. So people say the parasympathetic is rest and digest, but it does go a little bit deeper than that into these, you know, housekeeping activities and optimistic functioning. So that's why naturally our bodies are supposed to kind of pendulum swing between parasympathetic and sympathetic every 88 minutes to four hours. That's kind of the the scientific ballpark. But really, we as a Western society, we're not swinging every 88 minutes to four hours. We're just locked into sympathetic. And some people with high stress, high anxiety, you know, just all, all of this pressure we have in our day to day, that means we're to be locked in with like an IV drip of adrenaline going on in our body. And that's, in, that's really, that's tough. Yeah, and we so also tend to ramp up um, a lot faster than we ramp down. I mean, right. I mean, there's an evolutionary safety response to that. I think I always like to say you, you know, you're going to notice and get really interested in the snarling bear on a hike and you might not notice the beautiful things and sunsets and everything that will actually calm you down, but your brain is going to make sure you don't walk by the bear without noticing oh, yeah. it, right? So yeah, we, we get yeah. into that and we don't naturally get really relaxed really fast or anything like that. No, but I, it's amazing even what one huge deep breath and closing our eyes and just really having maybe for 30 seconds or just three deep breaths, that is enough to kind of deregulate a little bit, just kind of come mm-hmm. back down. But it does involve... Um, a little bit more time to really tap into and sink into the the parasympathetic to get the pendulum to swing the other way. But with the deep breath, it's like taking that step or, or inching the pendulum closer. It's, I think one of the, you alluded to one of the issues with the snarling bear, I, I like to refer to it as a tiger, is that our brain treats all stress like it, we're being tra- chased by a tiger, whether it's a thought whether it's an email, whether it's a something scary we just saw on TV, it's it's all going to be quote unquote paper tigers. Then these non life threatening stressors that cause the body to kick into high alert. There's no low gear for the nervous system. There just isn't. You know, we don't have a red light, green light, yellow. You know, or it's just full pedal. It's full high red alert. There's no orange alert, amber alert, <laughs> gold alert. There's no color scheme. It's just full. It's, it's hard. Full alert. It's, it's hard too because the same things that trigger oftentimes are uh, th- hard to do while if you know it's hard to do my homework while I'm being chased by a tiger, right? Um, and and even I'll be honest, I mean, even if I'm if I was hiking even around here and I saw a tiger snarling in the forest, uh, my brain would go get out of here, panic, panic. 
Way, way, way before it would say, what, how did a tiger get into the forest in Utah? That doesn't make any sense. I'd have to be a little calm to even ask that question, right? So you've never seen one of those uh, Utah tigers. I'm, <laughs> I know all about they, them. <laughs> yeah, man, they 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 hide really well, you know, so you mm-hmm. don't see them very often uh, until they get you. Until they get you, but <laughs> so. Well. Anyway, I think it's a good reminder because I sometimes forget that it's okay to have stress and actually we're meant to, and that it's okay to swing back and forth and that there's actually good kinds of stress that kind of get us moving. But this, this part that you're talking about is the being locked in it and the ways to kind of, I guess, heal or get out of it. And so with the breath, like how do you walk people through like even a breathing exercise? Because for the purpose of this podcast, I know that people say to themselves, um, I intend to breathe or I'm going to do it today. I know it's good for me, but then just don't end up doing it. And how do you set it up for people that like to, to really get into it and be more intentional about it? Amazing. And I think that's such a huge battle that we all face. It's not unique to any person who says, oh, I was planning on breathing better. I was planning on, you know, that's those intentions are so beautiful and I'm glad they're there. Uh, it is getting to the next step of actually executing or actually putting it on the to-do list. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny. I chose the word executing. Isn't that's a little violent, <laughs> but I would <laughs> say I you meant. it's mission <laughs> yes. objective thinking though, right? It's executing a plan. We got, yeah. Yeah. So I think step one is really learning how important it is to deregulate. So step one is just kind of acknowledging Okay, the day to day stress, when is some of it can be, you know, help us get moving, help us, you know, accomplish our tasks. There is so much value. Fear saves our life, and stress and fear can be put in the same zone and bucket in ways uh, for the purpose of this conversation. But um, when it comes to the actual site, like physiological, the physiological response to stress, understanding how dangerous that is in the long run really saying, oh my gosh, that's a huge deal. That's not just, oh, I was stressed for five days in a row. No big deal. Realizing that you you are kind of damaging and deteriorating a lot of your body over time. Like I'll just walk through a few is, so your adrenal glands that are on top of your little kidneys, they are pumping adrenaline to give you that like get up and go. It can be the equivalent to like three cups of coffee, like if you get really stressed. And it it actually is for the whole day if you are in sympathetic and IV drip all day. That's why anxiety, the feeling of shakiness, startling easy, uh, having a mind that just won't quite stop, or maybe you have trouble going to sleep. These are all linked to an overactivation of the stress response. So actually, if we're talking then about weight or about... Um, how our body processes foods, the glucose, the fats, and the proteins that are released from fatty tissues. So we don't actually have time to digest. The cells need to do their job, like running from a tiger. And so really quickly, our body just like, it's like a little pickpocket. It kind of goes in quickly and it grabs whatever it needs to get your body ready um, to fight or to flight. So you can't, like I like to think of it, you can't digest your lunch while you're running. So if this happens all day long, if you're stressed all day long, this means that you have muscle waste. You have extra glucose floating around in your cir- circulatory mm-hmm. system, which leads to circulatory disorders and strokes, clots, type 2 diabetes, Mm-hmm. all linked to an overactivation of the stress response. So I just mentioned clotting. It's also important to know that you start producing and releasing clotting agents and factors into your blood, and that increases your inflammation response because if a tiger bites you, you don't want to hemorrhage. But if you get an email, apparently your body says, I don't want to hemorrhage either <laughs> from my email. Um, so that kind of has a thicker blood. We have a little sludgy blood with all that extra clotting agents in our blood. I mean, I can go into what the pupils do, what's happening in our brain activity, the bronchial passages, like we can go down that rabbit hole, but just, you know, for the sake of our conversation, I would love for your listeners. I'm hoping after hearing, you know, a couple minutes of me rattling off a few facts, they think, Oh, my goodness. Okay. My entire system, not just my nervous system, but 
the stress is actually affecting your musculoskeletal, your respiratory, your cardiovascular, your endocrine, your gastrointestinal, your nervous and your reproductive systems. It's really damaging and kind of slowly wearing away as we're locked into the stress response. We're not swinging. We're not giving our body time to heal, process, flush. Uh, you know, it's all just kind of locked in there. And so since it is such a big deal, such a big deal, then I hope that's kind of the little, you know, that little push, the little catalyst, the little impetus to help people kind of get a little more in serious about incorporating some breath work or some mm -hmm. five minutes of meditation or 15 minutes of yoga in the morning. Like this can save your life. It can prevent disease. It can help you uh, come into not just wellness um, in the terms of, oh, I feel well today, but well in the future. And so walking people then through a few techniques that they can incorporate, recommending some apps, uh, mm -hmm. Titnot Hans, uh, Plum Village. There's an app uh, he has, uh, and I am, you know, he has, he did pass away this year in 2021. And um, that was, you know, a huge loss of a bodhisattva for us in this world, but wonderful that his app and his teachings and his books and everything live on. So Plum Village is an app that you can download for free and you can set a timer that once an hour, and it's very specific. It can be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It can be 9 a.m. to 5. You can set the time. It's specific. But once an hour, a little beautiful Tibetan bowl will just ding, ding. And then that encourages you to just for that three three bells, three ding, 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 just close your eyes and breathe deeply. And I love having that just set on my phone. So no matter what's going on, I just close my eyes and take three deep breaths whenever I hear the bell. Mm -hmm. I had one of those on a computer once when I, I had a job that where I sit at the computer more, you know, than I do now, but uh, where it would ding rand, you could set it to go randomly or whatever. And it was a mindfulness alert sort of thing. It's a very helpful type of thing. Um, I think, I don't know, it'd be interesting to get your reaction to this, but I think that part of this is the difficulty people have still in believing and appreciating the connection between physiology and psychology, right? And thinking that our stress and our thoughts are somehow separate. Um, the listeners of this show know we talk a lot about this, that you know, when people say, oh, is it a medical problem or is it a psychological problem? Is it an emotional problem or is it a medical problem? And it's like, those are all medical problems. <laughs> your, your brain and your emotions are generated inside your body, right? Um, so I think people don't link that up sometimes. So it's interesting to hear you talk about the, the real, even dangerous link that can be there if we don't attend to it. Yeah, and it's kind of scary, isn't it, to think that if our, it's emotional problem, a mental, uh, a medical, if it's all tied in together like that, I, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to kind of accept that because it means you don't get to just take a pill. You don't just get to do yoga 15 minutes a day and, and call it good. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of elements to being healthy and well and mm -hmm. education I think comes first. And it's also a, not a one size fits all. That's I think very important uh, point that what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you, but there is science-based facts and um, research out there and tons of studies. So you can gather some ideas and some um, some proven techniques, and then just see if that's what suits you and your needs best. Mm -hmm. And how do you approach diet? I noticed that, you know, you educate about like a plant-based diet and I'd love to hear more about like, how, um, how you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, not one size fits all. So I'm, I am a vegan, I'm plant-based. Um, I have wonderful friends who are raw food nutrition, nutritionalists. And today I had a great call with, someone called the health hero. And he does a lot with, um, with raw foods, but also living foods. And that was very interesting to learn more about sprouting, about sprouted beans, sprouted, um, alfalfa growing that in your house. So you can try to have this awake, alive, living food more in your diet. So again, not a one size fits all, always more to learn. And I think also acknowledging each step you can take to have more whole foods, just, you know, nothing with a label on it, nothing with the ingredients and processing on it. Um, I think we all can intuitively realize 
at some level, right, that if it's gone through three machines, a bleaching processor, seven additives, two preservatives, two color enhancers, and seven food dyes, that maybe it's a little bit harder for our body to process than an apple. Like, I think that's intuitive enough. I think yeah. I think we can all maybe agree on that, um, I would hope. But uh, I think I always try to help people not just with – uh, kind of little education or little ideas or inspiration, but also saying, okay, what step do you want to take? Yeah, like, do you want to try to do, like, what's your goal and what's realistic for your habits and your flavor palette, your family, your partner? It's mm-hmm. with with nutrition uh, coaching and vegan, plant based kind of consultations, it's not just about, okay, here's five recipes, give them a try. Mm -hmm. There's also psychology around food and kind of when you think something's taken away from you, how do you deal with it? There's societal and familial pressures. You know, when you say, okay, I'm going to go more plant-based to your family, what are they going to say to that? And are, do you want to talk about some strategies and ideas for how to respond? Because it's not always just a smooth little, oh, I'm going to do it and it's going to be super easy. It's not necessarily easy. And I think I want to help people understand, you know, you're not alone and there's tips and tricks. And I've learned a lot along my, my way and with my certifications and my journey, just about whole food, plant food. But as I mentioned, always learning. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of those elements. And I, I've, uh, I think that's why most, uh, dietary programs and most, most diet programs that are based around weight loss have terrible results when you do longitudinal studies and and long-term effects. Uh, even the most successful ones don't tend to work with a higher percentage and they don't tend to work for a long term because the focus is wrong. Uh, and you're talking about like a goal, if you're setting a, it's different to set a goal that boy I want to drop a few pounds than it is to to set a goal that I want to eat different and I just do and and forever versus that kind of a change. Yeah. Um, and I think a realistic goal to say is I don't want to get diagnosed with cancer. Like I know maybe that sounds very extreme to some of your listeners saying, oh my gosh, she's linking not eating you know plant food based foods to not getting cancer, but I would encourage your listeners just to maybe give that a Google, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. like check out some of the studies and the research out there that have linked, you know, all of the carcinogens and our foods because you are what you eat. I know that sounds so silly, but if you think about actually putting a blueberry in your mouth and remembering it literally disappears into your body and then is incorporated into your cells, like you are what you eat because it becomes your body. And so I think setting goals that have to do with long-term health are more successful than wanting to drop one pant size. And I also love encouraging people to set a goal that doesn't have to do with them. You know, saying, I want to be at my daughter's wedding. I want to be healthy Mm -hmm. enough that I can walk down that aisle and I'm not going to be hooked up to anything. Or, you know, there's a lot of prevention we can do. And I think that's, that's really key. To, to kind of kind of come at it with that knowledge, just knowing if you can set a goal that doesn't have to do with yourself, statistically you will be more su- a little bit more successful. That's mm-hmm. a great insight. It yeah, reminds me. I produce a podcast with uh, Dr. Erica Harris. She does this uh, podcast, Rise Today, inspirational, and she tells a story. She's a, a double lung transplant and cancer survivor, and she tells a story of looking out the window of her hospital. Uh, and seeing a grandma pushing a stroller and saying, well, that's probably, she assumed anyway, a grandma, I, I don't know if she went and tracked her down, but, um, and saying to herself, well, that's me. I want to be like that. I want to walk, walk with a grandkid someday. And she credits a lot of her survival to that, actually, although obviously there's medical <laughs> things that had to be done, but how that attitude kind of drove her to believe that she could do that. Uh, so it's really interesting when you say that. It's a really good tidbit for everybody out there is, Goals focused on uh, on others and including others. I realize that, it makes a lot of sense. I, I like that a lot. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also don't know. Have you guys ever read anything by Gretchen Rubin from The Happiness Project? Yeah. I okay. saw her documentary. Is it the documentary also? Happiness was based ha- on that, I think. I hope. I mean, I, I really actually good. that documentary. But. Yeah. But I'm familiar with it. Uh-huh. Cool. So she wrote a book called The Four Tendencies. And that I also think is really important in goal setting as well or developing new habits. So The Four Tendencies basically is, um, I'm going to make a gesture with my arms for those of you who get to watch the Patreon version. Um, So it's a quadrant of four and it's all with how you deal with expectations. 
Is it internal or external? So there's four different types of people. Uh, do you have, are you an upholder? So internal and external expectations are super important for you. That means if someone tells you to do it and you you get on board with that, or you're telling yourself you, you, you do it, need to do it, you'll get on board with that. Those are the upholders. You know, it's, it's not hard. Once they decide to do something, they'll do it. Whether you tell them or they tell themselves, the obliger will only, um, do it and really follow through if someone's holding them accountable. Someone else expects them to do it. They're like, okay, I got to do it. They said it. But making that time and prioritizing something for themselves maybe feels selfish or feels like, nope, I don't, I, I, I can't choose me. I got to choose what they need. And if someone's telling you externally, I need it, that's the obliger. Questioners prioritize their own expectations. So they need to decide. They need to be their own account, accountability partner. Rebels are the trickiest of the bunch. External and internal are not important, so they need to usually find something very bespoke, a bespoke strategy that really will help them with their goals, whether it's just the awareness of saying, hey, I'm a rebel, so that means that my expectations and others don't matter to me, so I need to figure out something that can work. I think the more aware we are of our own tendencies and habits and brain patterns, which is amazing to learn about in meditation and observing your mind, but you can also read... Gretchen Rubin's The Four Tendencies or about the Enneagram or, you know, do a golden personality profiler and just learn more about you and how you Mm -hmm. have expectations, you set goals, how you process, how you relate to people. Um, You're just more self-knowledge is going to be your friend on the journey Mm -hmm. to wellness. Mm -hmm. I found clients that have taken that assessment and it, it validates their own experience. And then it's like, okay, yep. This is true. Puts more words to it. And then it's like, okay, let's come up with a plan now. Like you're going to need more people in your life, for example, to help hold you accountable, or you're able to do this on your own. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I I found that to be really helpful for people. Absolutely. I think when we say it, we name it, we claim it, then we can feel deal and heal. Like, let's go. (laughs) And it works better when you rhyme it. Uh, I found too, at least to remember, but also I think, it just, I think it just works better. <laughs> yeah. So I, is that a challenge to try to rhyme the rest of the podcast? Cause I, I don't know so. how long I'll last. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, with, within the few minutes we have left, in fact, uh, maybe the, you could work that well, out. I wanted to kind of talk about chakra healing and I'm trying to sit here and think, how am I going to put some rhyming in here? I'm not yeah. quite sure. Chakra is a hard word to rhyme, but chakra, let's try it. Chakra. Um, I know we have a couple more minutes, but do we have time to talk a little bit about chakra healing? Let's do it. Yeah. So how do you think like for people out there who've never heard of, or may have heard of chakras, um, how do you explain it to people? Like how that shows up in their body or their field of being a person. Yeah. I love talking about chakras and what's amazing is that, okay, so we'll go back one step back is that chakras are ancient, you know, Eastern knowledge of different energy centers in our bodies. So there's not, there's these classic seven that we talk about, but there's also small chakra centers in the palms of our hands and our feet. And there's different centers in the body, but this seven classic is what we really focus on. Um, in books or in conversation. So it follows your spine. And what's amazing is now that Western medicine has studied uh, or has started to study, you know, chakras, it's like there's these huge nucleus of nerves at every single point. It, it's amazing how it's like kind of scientifically backed that these are heavy duty actual energy centers, whether it's for, you know, processing or, um, you know, our reproductive system or our digestive or our cardiac, you know, like it's, it's actually at the system center points. So the seven centers, it's going to start at your root. So of your pelvic bowl, which is technically the perineum and that's Muladhara chakra. And so each chakra is, goes straight up the spine to the top of your head, which was Sahasra, the top chakra. Um, and each one is associated with with a color, with a symbol, with a sound, with a stone, with a smell, like they have all these things, but mainly it has to do with kind of a huge part of our journey of being human, Uh, whether that's the base chakra of home and safety and stability and security. And if that's out of balance, then that can manifest with 
high anxiety and fear based, or you can be really, really clingy and codependent. You know, there's, there's different ways that it can swing if you're, if it's over-functioning or under-functioning. And so it's just amazing to learn more about the chakras as well as one of these, if you want to look at it this way, as a way of knowing ourselves better of saying, oh, that could be an imbalance or that could be, oh, I, that, that's why that always has been a huge tight part of my body. Has your hips always been like, I can't sit cross-legged. It's kick, it kicks my butt. I can't do it. Then that might be a problem with your root chakra because your hips are so tight because there's an imbalance or you have issues around feeling safe, or maybe you have a really upset stomach all the time and you struggle with self-esteem. Then that's an imbalance in your third chakra, your solar plexus right around the belly button. And that's going to manifest physically as well as emotionally, mentally, all of these levels, all of the koshas, all the sheaths of our energy system. So then working with yourself or with an energy healer to try to get that back in balance. Um, Reiki practitioners, I'm a master healer myself. You can do crystal healing. You can do so many different things, even if it's a meditation based or a yoga class. I teach whole yoga classes based on balancing the chakras. So it's amazing what we can do, and it is a great way of understanding the self better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, my first intro, and this was shared with me by a client uh, to chakras, and I'll throw this out there for anybody who is intimidated. Uh, you can check out, there's an episode of Avatar, The Last Airbender, if you're familiar. <laughs> it's a, a, Yeah, and, and they have an episode that called The Guru. I've had to look it up and mention it to people. It's actually where the the protagonist learns about this and goes through a very good introductory, actually, and then to a springing off point to actually talk to you know teachers and people who do that like you. It's been very interesting to see people go through that, and like you said, it's a it's an interesting way to focus, just like from that psychological perspective. But then there's just the underlying feeling of uh, well of belief and investment into that, and people mm-hmm. really seem to get a lot out of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's ancient wisdom. Yeah. It's ancient yeah. and it's amazing how things that were written about 10,000 years ago, how science is like, Oh, that is where By each way, major just... nucleus of nerves sits. It's like, well, okay. You know? Yeah. And oh, one of my favorite stories in the same vein is that, um, I love that the Dalai Lama loves science. He just totally thinks it's fascinating, but he was at a quantum physics convention or, and he was sitting with a bunch of scientists and they were, they were saying something and he was going, yes, yes, yes. Like agreeing with everything. And they looked at him and said, how do you know this without studying physics? And he looked at them and went, how do you know this without meditating? Hmm. (laughs) It's amazing. It is amazing Mm -hmm. what, how East and West have really come together, I think, in the last, you know, few decades and really kind of strengthened each other's knowledge. And um, there is, you don't have to believe anything you don't want to believe. I don't want you to believe in chakras. I don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. I, I don't want to push anything on anyone. But if it's something that resonates and you're curious about and you think there might be something of value there, then, oh, yeah, like, let's talk. Let's Let's dive in. But if it's not for you, awesome. I'm so happy it's not for you too, because then something else will be. And that's cool too. That's something I really like about your approach. And I tend to gravitate to guests on the show who have that attitude of, of meeting people where they're at, individualizing. I think that's very important. Well, uh, just as we're uh, about to, to wrap up for today, I like to ask guests who come on uh, if they have any kind of a charity or a nonprofit or anything that they would, would, uh, plug it can be related to what we're talking about but it doesn't have to be um do you have any charities that are near and dear to you oh thanks for bringing that up um i've definitely had you know the joy and the privilege of working with united way or the state of women or different organizations in the past um but i would say that right now there is so many different communities and cultures in need um, I did a yoga class for Ukraine and for specifically serving the um, marginalized community there. So I can drop a drop a link and, and hopefully you can share that in the show notes. I think that anything we can do for Ukraine or BLM or Planned Parenthood or wherever anybody wants to to donate right now, I feel that there's so many people in need. Um, but there is a, a special organization that um, 
is in Nepal and they specifically deliver meals and food to monks who, you know, everything with monasteries because of COVID, uh, where it was hit kind of hard. So it was really a great opportunity as well to kind of be able to serve people who have nothing and they have no way of making money, no way of anything. And so that Mm -hmm. was a good, a really good one I got involved with during the pandemic, but it's something I would love to bring up because it's probably not on people's field of radar. I hadn't thought about that community of monasteries and things. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Plug uh, and tell everybody your podcast, your website, where they can find you one more time. Thanks. Yeah. So wildyogatribe.com, the Wild Yoga Tribe podcast, and I'm on social media wherever you are. Hopefully I'm there too. Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the good stuff at Wild Yoga Tribe. So I would love to see you guys react, uh, interact, react, hang out, jive, jam, whatever you want to do. Let's, let's hang out. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, I noticed that you did a lot of cool retreats, like in these really beautiful locations. Do you have any places that like you have upcoming that you really want to go to and and teach people? Oh, I love that question. And so I'm, I'm in, I was looking at Peru pretty heavily. I had some meetings scheduled and was really excited to try to do something in the sacred Valley. I'm not sure if that's going to work for 2022. And so looking more at a few other spots. So just check out my website, wild yoga tribe, nothing's officially announced, but I do have a sign up form. If, if anyone wants to get a notification or a ping, um, and, uh, also on social media, I'll post about it. Uh, Kathleen, do you want to mention uh, where people can find you? So Instagram at this point, at Kathleen R. Brennan. Um, and then I do have episodes from On the Blue Couch podcast on my website, on the um, as well as iTunes. So Great. Um, that's where I'm at at this point. Wonderful. And uh, mm-hmm. I guess I just want to plug Avatar The Last Airbender. And uh, now that it's mm-hmm. on my mind, I'll have to go watch it. So everyone else should too. And uh, mostly uh, follow us on social media at Break a Brain on Twitter. You can go to uh, at Brainiacs Ahoy on Instagram. It's a new thing. Hopefully, I remember to post on it as well. And uh, thank you once again so much, Lily yeah. and uh, Kathleen. Thank you also for co hosting. Of course. Today. Yeah. This is fun. I learned a lot from, from everybody. Yeah. It was a joy to be with you guys. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.